Thanks, brother. Thanks, Diane. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, some of the work that I've been doing now. I, I think I started doing this work in 1993, so it's about um, about 22 years old, the, the work. I, I'm not going to give you the whole history of how I came to this, but I'm going to give you a little bit of the history. Um, the title is Using the Critical Race Tools of Racial Microaggressions to Examine Everyday Racism in Academic Spaces. This can also include social spaces, but we'll, we, we'll talk about social spaces as we go through this presentation. But I, um, but I started working in this right about the time I got introduced to critical race theory. I first came across critical race theory in 1993, serendipitously. I, I was at East Los Angeles College Library. I was looking at Chronicles of Higher Education, and I came on a, a page seven or page eight article on critical race theory. And I read it, and I never heard of it before. It's the first time I heard of it. It was, it, was a, it, was a, it, was, it was work in the law, and I thought it was really important, and I figured that I needed to take some time and ask my, my chair of my department if I could take some time to, to do some research on this, to see what it was, and then to, and I wanted to apply it to the social science fields, in particular education. And so that's what I did. I spent a couple of uh, quarters um, in, in the library, the law library at UCLA, in 1993, and if you remember 1993, there was no internet. So it was just a Xerox card, indexes, and just, just going up and down the, 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 um, the stairwells, in the stacks, looking for uh, law review articles. And I read and read and read many, many law review articles. And I'll, what, le what this led up to is, 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 a, is a short, truncated definition of critical race theory. You're not going to get a, a, a presentation on critical race theory tonight. You're going to get one on r racial microaggressions. But I want to put it in context by just defining critical race theory for you. And this is what I came up with. I argue that this is my working definition. I argue that critical race theory is the work of scholars, like many of us in this room, who are developing an explanatory framework, because that's what theory is. It's an explanatory framework that accounts for the role of race and racism in education. And that's what we do. That's the kind of work we do. But if we continue on by saying that critical race theory in education works towards identifying and challenging racism, so that there's that social justice element to it, in its historical and its contemporary forms. So we look at these issues. So if we're looking at something, as you'll see many examples I'll give you today that are happening right now. I'll give you an example that happened two weeks ago at UCLA. But we have to look at these from an historical perspective. History can help us understand what's happening today. Um, as part of a larger goal of identifying and challenging all forms of subordination. So this is where critical race theory intersects with sexism, homophobia, uh, nativism, etc. And so that's my definition. That's what guides my work. And that's what's been guiding my work at least around 1993, 1994, for about uh, 20 years or so. So here's how I got to do work in racial microaggressions. Um, as I was mentioning, I I was spending hours and days and months and probably years in the law library. I'm not sure if any of you worked in law libraries. They're different. If you, if you read law, law articles, they're different. Um, You've got to learn how to read law articles. I mean, they footnote the heck out of these articles. And sometimes the footnotes are the, are the story. I mean, I, I found that the, the footnotes really told the story uh, of many of these articles. But I found this article in the Yale Law Journal. It was a 1989 article called Law is Microaggression written by Peggy Davis. And so this had to be about 1993, 1994, right about that time when I first looked at this article. And um, it's the first time I seen the word microaggression. I had never seen the word, certainly not, not in a title, and this is the first time I seen it in a sentence. So as I got to page uh, 1560 in this law review article, it said, in section two, I say, parenthetically the scene below, will be analyzed from the point of view of a black participant and as an instance of, quote, incessant, often gratuitous, and subtle offenses, close quote, defined by black mental health professionals as microaggressions. So that's the first time I've seen it in a sentence. First time I've seen the word in a sentence. And I looked at that number five right there, that footnote, and I went down to the footnote, I found Chester Pierce. When I found Chester Pierce, I found sort of the origins of racial microaggressions. And so 
Uh, this particular article by Chet and uh, Wesley Prophet is called Homoracial Behavior in the United States. It was a two-page article that it took me almost two decades to finally find. I never found it in the beginning. It was, I, it was unpublished and nobody was publishing it. And I finally found it in this obscure um, edited book and it was a good piece, a good two-page piece that again introduced me again, once again, to uh, Chet's work. Um, this is Chet Pierce. And we have to honor Chet Pierce, at least I have to honor Chet Pierce, because he's the one that introduced me to this work. Right? He's the one that continues to influence my work and the work of my students and my colleagues. We keep reading and rereading Chet's work, because every time we reread it, we find new gems in his work. Uh, Chet is a professor emeritus. He's retired at, from Harvard, uh, the Graduate School of Education, and he has a second appointment at the, uh, the Harvard School of Medicine in Psychiatry. That's where, I mean, that, again, this is where he ended his career. It's not where he began his career, but this is where he ended his career. And, and, and much of his work, his later work on, on racial microaggressions occurred while he was a professor at Harvard. So he, he's the one that introduced me to these, these concepts. But this is what he said about 41 years ago. This is what he said 41 years ago. Chet said, one must not look for the gross and obvious. The subtle cumulative mini assault is the substance of today's racism. I think we can stay, say the same thing in 2015. There are these subtle, everyday forms of racism that is the substance of today's racism. And we'll talk about that. You may disagree with that, but I'd like to have a conversation with you if, 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 on any of the things I talk about here, uh, whether you agree or disagree. He also stated, he also called them mundane microtraumas. This is another word I just found the other day in one of his old pieces. Uh, almost everyday micro traumas. And um, I'm meeting with a colleague uh, on Sunday morning here, and we're going to talk about some of his research on trauma, uh, how teachers go through trauma. And I want to introduce him to some of this, this work that Chet was talking about in terms of micro tra trauma, but we'll see. So here's how I define racial microaggressions. This is how I've come to define it over the years. I say that racial microaggressions are one form of systemic everyday racism used to keep those in the, in, in, in the racial margins in their place. So it's a form of systemic everyday racism used to keep those at the racial margins in their place. Racial microaggressions, I argue, are verbal and nonverbal assaults, and I'll give you examples in a second, directed towards people of color, often, often, not always, but often carried out in subtle, automatic, or unconscious forms. Racial microaggressions are layered assaults. They, they can be based on a person's race, her gender, her class, her sexuality, her language, her immigration status, her phenotype, her accent, her surname. And racial microaggressions are cumulative. They happen over and over again. That can take a physiological, a physical toll, a psychological, and an academic toll on people of color who experience them. In 74, Pierce went on to say, these pro because the, the question we often get is that the word micro in microaggressions, they said, well, how could, these are not micro, right? And people will, will critique those of us who do this work on, 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 the, on the word choice. But I think Chet anticipated this 41 years ago. He said, those problems are only micro in name since their very number requires a total effort that is incalculable. I go on to say that, barring from Chet, that the micro and microaggressions does not mean less than. The micro and microaggression means in the everyday. So here's a model that we're using to try to understand everyday racism in the form of racial microaggression. So here's the racial microaggression. And it takes place within this, 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 this space of institutional racism. Um, wherever we find those spaces, UCLA, Mills, Berkeley, um, the, the, the mall down the street. We, we, it, we find these everyday occurrences in multiple spaces, as you'll see in a second. And you have a perpetrator, someone who's, who, who, who's the, the assaulter, and you have a tar primary target, someone who's on the receiving end of the racial microaggression. But you can also have, and we'll call that person for now Robert, you can also have a secondary target, someone who's the, the, these assaults, these, these um, microaggressions are not directed towards, 
but yet are in, are, are, are in the present, hear them, see them, and they could be impacted by these racial microaggressions. We call them secondary targets. Uh, we'll call him Michael. Allison is the target, uh, I'm sorry, the perpetrator for, for, for now. Um, and this is the comment she makes. And this is taken from some of the data that we've collected over the last 21 years uh, in, in, in our research on racial microaggressions. So she said, I didn't think blacks were good in math, but you are, right? And so Robert can respond by saying, uh, come again, or he can say something else. But he, he responds. We can talk about his response later as we move forward in the model. And he, what, however he responds, Allison might counter by saying, but that's not what I meant. Right? She might say, but I meant it as a compliment. Or she might say, you're being too sensitive. Or it was just a joke. Get a sense of humor. And that's what we often hear in these contexts. So what we're, look, what we're saying, we're showing here is that my work, and, and I want to be clear about my work, because I, I know we'll get questions about, about who, who I do work with and why I do the work that I do. I, I don't look at the intent of the perpetrator. I suppose Daryl Sue will do that in his work. Daryl Sue at Columbia University, he does some of that work because he works with in a counseling program. And he looks at counselors and counselees, counselors and, 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 and his, uh, his clients or her clients. And so he looks at intent. And maybe if you're looking at some of the implicit bias work, they look at intent, the intent of the perpetrator. I don't do that work. Although I do the work, as I'll show you in a second, as it, from the perspective of the target. But I look at the impact. I look at the impact of the racial microaggression on the, on the, on the person on the receiving end of that microaggression, right? And I will look at, at the perpetrator, but I'll look at that perpetrator only through the eyes of the target, right? That's the work that I do. So here's another model that we're using. We'll take you through the different steps of this model. It's a model for understanding and possibly doing research on racial microaggressions. We, could, we can use that as a research tool as well. And so we talk about types of racial microaggressions. So here's some examples. And I'll, I'll, I'll sort of, uh, these are quotes, and I'll read these quotes for you. Uh, they, they, we have verbal and nonverbal, where we talked about that earlier. So here's a, an example of a verbal microaggression. Some examples that we've found in our research over the years. When I think about those blacks, I, I, wasn't, think, I wasn't really thinking about you. Meant to be a compliment, I assume. If you're on the sending end of that. If you're on the receiving end, maybe not so. You're not like the rest of them. You're different. I don't think of you as a Mexican. Hmm. You speak such good English. But you speak without an accent. Finally, how do black people feel about? And there's so many things that people are asking black people how they feel about, how, uh, that, as if they're the spokesperson for the race. So here's another example. There are very few African American men in this country who haven't had the experience of being followed when they were, sh in a sh were shopping in a department store. That includes me. There are very few African American men who haven't had the experience of walking across the street and hearing the locks click on the doors of cars. That happens to me. There are very few African Americans who haven't had the experience of getting in an elevator and a woman clutching her purse nervously and holding her breath until she had a chance to get off. That happens often. As I, I underlined examples of racial microaggressions in that text. But who, who do you think, who, who's um, talking here? Whose words are these? Anyone want to venture a guess? President Obama. President Obama gave, in July 19, 2013, if you recall, that was the day that the George Zimmerman verdict came down in the murder of Trayvon Martin. And I'm not sure where you were that day, but a lot of people were really concerned about how people are going to react to that verdict. I mean, we don't have to, I mean, there's, there's, there's a history, we have a history of, of communities being very upset about um, verdicts that go the wrong way from their, from, from, from their perspective. And President Obama 
late that afternoon, I think it was about three or four o'clock in the afternoon, he went to the press room at the White House and he talked for 17 minutes. And I would recommend you get that, that it's, it's on YouTube. But he was basically speaking to the country. And this is what he was saying, right? There's, there's racial microaggressions are nowhere in that, 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 that conversation he was having with us on July 19, 2013. But as a researcher, they were everywhere. They're everywhere in that text, everywhere in that narrative. And race matters, I'll give you another one. And race matters for reasons that are really only skin deep, that cannot be discussed any other way, and that cannot be wished away. Race matters to a young man's view of society when he spends his teenage years watching others tense up as he passes, no matter the neighborhood where he grew up. Race matters to a young woman's sense of self when she states her hometown and then is pressed, no, where are you really from? regardless of how many generations her family has been in this country, in the country. Race matters to a young person addressed by a stranger in a foreign language, which he does not understand because only English is spoken at home. Race matters because of the slights, the snickers, the silent judgments that reinforce the most crippling of thoughts. I do not belong here. Anyone want to venture a guess who that comes from? Justice Sotomayor, right? Sonia Sotomayor, a sitting justice, an associate justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, in a case last term, uh, the Shewitt versus Bam case, the affirmative action case out of, out of Michigan, um, she came out with a dissent. She lost. Her and um, Ruth Ginsburg, Ruth Ginsburg con con concurred on this, uh, on this dissent. But it's rare that you hear sitting justices talk about race in this way. Talk about racism in this way, right? The last time I heard a justice speak about racism, and I would call it in a, in a critical fashion such as this, was when Thurgood Marshall was on the court, in his dissents. And I would, I would recommend you go, well, I recommend you go back and read this dissent. You can go on to the Supreme Court website and download the, uh, the, 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 the transcript of the, or the opinion. And read the, it's about a 60 word opinion, a 60 page opinion, I'm sorry. And it's a really powerful opinion where, they're, where she's basically making the argument um, that the court made a mistake because it didn't address everyday racism and it didn't address institutional racism. And I would recommend you take a look at that. And I also recommend you look at some of Justice Marshall's dissents. You know, go back and look at the Rodriguez case. It's an amazing case that he wrote a dissent um, in, in back, I believe, in the late 1970s. But again, in many, unfortunately, in many of these cases, they're writing their dissents um, in, 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 in losing important cases that go before the court. Um, Nonverbal microaggressions. I hope this works. This, you're going to see this for the first time, I think. Yes, OK. Um, last, earlier this was the 20th. When was the 20th? Was it Monday? Uh, Okay, it was earlier this week, my, my days are all mixed up. Um, I don't know if you watch, I, sometimes I get up in the morning and I'll watch um, this, the CBS This Morning program. And I was, there's this, there was a, a, pro, a three minute, four minute program called Clocking Success. And uh, it, it was about the White House Astronomy Night that was held this week in, in Washington DC that was hosted by President Obama. And it, 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 there's a segment here that I wanna share with you about a, a minute segment uh, about Ahmed Mohammed. If you don't know, he's the young man who, in Irving, Texas, in high school, uh, as you'll see here in a second, he brought a clock in, uh, onto campus uh, to uh, impress his engineering teacher. But another teacher, his English teacher, wasn't so impressed. But I want you to sort of focus on body movements, kinesthetics, right, uh, as, as, as a form of nonverbal microaggression. I learned that people will always be there to support you when you're seeing justice. Anything else? Oh, yeah, definitely. There was a ton that I learned. I'm trying to get a message of how you shouldn't judge a person by what, or what they look like, and you should always judge a person by their heart. Just over a month ago, Ahmed brought this crude digital clock he constructed at home to school. The motive impressed his engineering teacher, but his English teacher saw the contraption and thought it might be a bomb. 
how rapidly did you know things were sort of moving in a different direction? When I saw her, my eyebrows go up. Like that. <laughs> Ahmed was arrested and suspended from school. Tech executives around the country rallied to his cause, and Mr. Obama took to Twitter to praise his innovative spirit. When, is that, when her eyebrows went up. That's a nonverbal form of communication. And he clearly picked it up. Right? You've been in meetings, and many of you probably, and you'll see the rolling of the eyes. Right? Uh, that's another one of those nonverbal communications. There are others. We can talk about that. But this is an area of racial microaggressions that we're, we haven't really explored. Uh, most of my work doesn't, doesn't look at this, this, this area, but I'm hoping that someone in this room or some other room will start to pick up this, you know, this, this study these very other forms that we don't often study of racial microaggressions and gender microaggressions, et cetera. Um, visual microaggressions. I'm going to go back a bit in history uh, and, and share some of these with you. Um, this is 1949, Dimmit, Texas. This was in a, a, a restaurant uh, window. It says, we serve whites only, no Spanish or Mexicans. And you might say, well, that's not a microaggression. How could that be a microaggression? But if you remember what I said earlier, I said um, everyday forms of racism. It's racism in the everyday. And if you lived in Demet, Texas, 1949, this is every day. You see these signs, right? You see signs that sort of um, tell you, as a Mexican, or, or, or Spanish, um, that, that you don't belong here, right? Or if you're in Birmingham, Alabama in 1956, this is a photo by, a famous photo, amazing photo by Gordon Parks uh, called the department store. This, this young African-American mother with her daughter in front of the store under the sign of the colored entrance. That's everyday racism. That, that, that's what we're talking about in terms of everyday racism in the visual forms. There are other forms. I mean, we can, we, could, we can look at textbooks. And sometimes we can see stereotypes in textbooks, you know, racial stereotypes in textbooks. We can also, racial microaggressions can also be what's not there. When you pick up a textbook as a, as a high school student or an elementary school student, and you don't see yourself in the textbook, right? You're, you're erased from, from history, or you're erased from literature, et cetera. Um, these are some more examples, and we're seeing, unfortunately, more and more of these examples across the country. I'm going to do a couple of these. This is the Kappa Alpha Theta sorority at the Columbia University in February of 2014. I think this was called a Mexican night or something like that. So these young women are um, trying to look like Mexicans, and I think it's, when you read the, 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 the blog post, uh, act like Mexicans, whatever that means. This is the UC Davis lacrosse team. This is the woman's team, right, who had this, um, who posted this on their blog, or a blog. Uh, they're dressed like cholos, Mexican gang members, Chicano gang members. This happened two weeks ago at UCLA. This is the Kanye Western party at um, one of the fraternities on campus. And these were, you know, young men and women fraternity and sorority members dressing up black. And I, I you know, I, again, I, I've been in higher education for 44 years. And I remember things like this from the beginning when I started in 1968, right? It's just that in, 19, in 2015, we have the internet and we have people post these pictures and we, we see them more. But I can remember them in every institution I've been at, whether as a student or as, or, or as, or as a faculty member. I've seen examples of, the, of, 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 this, of this behavior. And I often ask myself, I mean, do they think? I mean, what are they thinking when they engage in this type of behavior? I would love to know. I mean, do they think this is OK to, to depict blacks or Mexicans or Chicanos in this way, or Chicanas in this way? Um, I, I'd love to, someone to do this research. You know, I, 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 I couldn't do the research because as a, as, as a person of color walking into a space and you start asking questions about behavior like this, I know I'm not going to get, I'm, I'm going to get a socially acceptable response. I'm not going to get a true response, I don't think. I, I, I don't really think I, I, I would. I think there's someone out there, someone out there 
that can do this research and probably should be doing this research. At UCLA right now, because of this, we have, we, we have a, this is the first year we have a, a vice chancellor for equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, Jerry Kong. And within, I guess within a day, Jerry basically suspended these two, this sorority and fraternity, and he, he has an investigation on right now. I want to find out what that investigation finds. I want to find out what, they, how, what they're thinking when they engage in this type of behavior. Context. They, 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 these racial microaggressions occur in space, in various spaces, various contexts. While you're walking down the street, right, whether it's here in the Bay Area or in Southern California, uh, New York City, Chicago, um, any, just about anywhere, you have these, you, you can experience these, racial, these forms of racial microaggressions. They happen in shopping malls. They often happen in shopping malls or in spaces, department stores, or, 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 or small shops. And a couple of things happen in these spaces. One, a person of color can walk into these stores and can be hyper visible. Meaning people, the, the sh shopkeeper can walk around the store and ask you, can I help you? Can I help you? Can I help you? Right? Uh, really telling you, not that they want to help you, but that they don't really think you should be there. There's, a, there's an example, I think, two weeks ago in Georgetown, in Washington, D.C., where there's an app now that is being used uh, by department stores that tracks suspicious customers, not just within the store, it tracks them between stores. And they found that about 80% of the people they track through this app are African American. Hyper visibility. It can also, you can also be invisible. You can walk into a space and people will ignore you. You can walk into a restaurant and not get served. And people come behind you and get served. There are other places that we can talk about, about where, where, where folks of color are invisible and experience these various forms of racial microaggressions. Another quote. Instead, they will make assumptions about who they think you are based on their limited notion of the world. We both felt the sting of those daily slights throughout our entire lives, the folks who crossed the street in fear of their safety, the clerks who kept a close eye on us in all those department stores, the people at formal events who assumed we were the help, and those, of, uh, those who have questioned our intelligence, our honesty, even our love of this country. Anyone? Michelle Obama. She gave this speech last spring at a commencement, her commencement address at Tuskegee, Tuskegee University, a historically black college in Alabama. But again, she wasn't talking, she wasn't using the word racial microaggressions, but as someone who looks at text, racial microaggressions are all through her speech, at least that particular part of her speech. And by the way, she was really criticized for the speech. If you go on to the, the, the blogs after, they blasted her for this speech, that now the true Michelle had come out. Uh, now her, the, 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 the black Michelle had come out. Another space that it happens is classrooms. And I, again, I go back to Chet to help me understand what he experienced in classrooms at Harvard University. And this is what Chet, what, what he said in a 1970 article uh, when he talks about racial, beginning to talk about racial microaggressions. Actually, it's one of the first articles he ever wrote on racial microaggressions. It's called Offensive Mechanisms. That's the title of the piece. It's a chapter in a book. But if you want to start anywhere, start with that, that piece. It's called Offensive Mechanisms. And this is what he said. He said, I noticed in, cl in a class I teach that after each session, a white, not a, not a black, will come up to me and tell me how the class should be structured how the chairs should be placed, or how there should be extra meetings outside of the classroom, etc. One could argue that I'm hypersensitive, if not paranoid, about what I know every black will understand is this not what the student says in this dialogue. It's how he approaches me, how he talks to me, how he seems to regard me. I, am, I was patronized. I was told by my own perceptual distortions, perhaps, that although I'm a full professor on two faculties at a prestigious university, to him I was no more than a big black nigger. 
I had to be instructed and directed as how to render him more pleasure. There are more examples of this. And I'll, 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 if, if, I would really recommend this book if you have a chance to read it. I'm not sure if any of you are reading this in your classes here. Uh, we're, we're starting to make this required reading for some of our classes at UCLA, especially for our incoming students at UCLA. It's called Presumed Incompetent. Right? And the subtitle is The Intersection of Race and Class for Women in, the, in Academia. Right? It's about 27, 28 bi autobiographies of women of color in, in various spaces, mostly in classroom spaces or in academic spaces. But they're talking in these spaces. I mean, they, they're giving similar examples that Chet just gave us. There are, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a painful book to read but it's an important book to read. I know around the country there are reading groups uh, that are reading this book and having conversations about this book and engaging in conversations about this book. Um, in my own research, my year-long research course last year, we read this book uh, for the whole year and had conversations, discussions uh, around some of the stories uh, of, that these women of, of color shared with us, these academic women of color shared with us. But if you, don't, if, you, if you only read one chapter, which I hope you read most, more, more, more than one, but if you read one chapter, read chapter 30, because chapter 30 is lessons from the experiences of women of color working in academia. So it brings all of it together. It's a powerful chapter that brings the, the, the stories and what we learn from these stories um, uh, in, 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 one, in, in one space. So we talked about the types, the context, the effects. How these racial microaggressions, the everyday forms of racism, affect people on the receiving end. They're painful. They hurt. You get angry, stressed, or what our colleague at the University of Utah, William Smith, calls racial battle fatigue. You doubt yourself, or what people call the imposter syndrome. When are they going to find out that I shouldn't be here? Poor academic performance. I think our colleague, um, I think he's up at Berkeley now, uh, Claude Steele, uh, him and Josh Aronson wrote early on about this, this concept called stereotype threat. And you know, stereotype threat is, is, is that it, it's a powerful sort of tool. I mean, it's a powerful way of looking at how when people of color the effect that people of color have, the experience they have when they, the fear that they're going to reinforce a stereotype. What does that do to them? How does that impact them? And what they found that it impacts them in various ways, often academic. So in terms of testing situations or other, other types of situations, um, it, it affects their academic performance, this, this concept of stereotype threat. But it can also affect Women in various contexts, they studied that as well. Um, white males in various contexts. When you put white males in, in, in comparison to Asian American males in a math test, it, stereoty the stereotype threat affects their, the white male scores on, on, on tests as well. Uh, read his work, but if, 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 you, if you're going to start someplace, I would read Whistling Vivaldi, that book, because there he's really speaking to us. He's speaking to non-psychologists uh, about how this concept of stereotype has evolved and its importance. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really powerful, powerful book, Whistling Vivaldi. But the poor outcomes is one of those things that I think uh, I, I want to focus on. I mean, just how everyday racism affects um, the health outcomes for people of color, those on the receiving end. And so I'm going to share with you a short snippet called Unnatural Causes, 2008. Um, a film, actually a series of, of, of videos. I'm not sure if you have them here in your, in your video library or DVD library. There's seven episodes. The first episode is called In Sickness and in Wealth. Um, there, there's going to be two people that we're going to be talking to you or to us. Um, Edwell Troutman, who's the director of the Louisville, Kentucky Department of Public Health and Wellness, and S. Leonard Syme, professor of epidemiology at UC Berkeley. And they're talking about the effects of race and racism on health outcomes. And poor or not, the heck happened? Be worse. I live in Jefferson County. In Jefferson, you come to travel the wrong way to get here. 
I'm clear that, uh, that on the social gradient, that line that we talked about earlier, that I'm on the top of that line. Can I? I will be here. I'm highly educated. I have a medical degree. I have several other degrees. I make good money. I live in a good neighborhood. Uh, and But I know that according to the research, if you're an African American, no matter what your social status, your socioeconomic status, your health outcomes are going to be worse than your white counterpart. African Americans die earlier and have higher rates than whites of many chronic diseases across the social gradient. Why should there be an elevated risk of disease in African Americans of higher social class? Bad genetics. Not true. When you look at other countries where the discrimination is not as prevalent, you don't find those kinds of rates. So something's happening. As a physician, I've been followed around the store when I go in to buy something. I've been looked at as scanned. So I've, I've seen a, a, a woman grab her purse when I come into the elevator. And for goodness sakes, you know, I am Dr. Troutman, you know, well, why this shouldn't happen to me, but it does. The whole idea of, of vigilance and the, and the burden that it takes to be constantly on guard over time really does change biological markers and make people vulnerable to getting sick. Racial discrimination can be an added stressor linked with high blood pressure, increased rates of infant death, coronary artery disease, Troutman knows what this can lead to. He authored a cornerstone study with former Surgeon General David Satcher on excess death among African Americans. It was a national study, and we found over 83,000 excess deaths per year in the African American community alone. 83,000 excess deaths each year. That's the equivalent of a major airliner filled with black passengers falling out of the sky every single day, every year. I mean, the power of that imagery is one thing. Um, but I think what he's, there's a couple of other things. I mean, what's, the epidemiologist is telling us also is that this idea of vigilance, what, is, what does it take to always be on guard? And what impact does that have on your health outcomes? I'm not sure if you've ever been in a situation where you've, you've been in a situation where you're, you're confronted around any issue, but let's say an issue of race or gender, um, and something kicks in. I mean, something happens physiologically to you. I mean, have you ever felt that sort of um, something in, in, in your throat right here? Well, often people say that's adrenaline, basically, it's, or cortisol. It's basically a, a drug that, that, uh, that you create to protect you. But that drug that's meant to protect you can also hurt you over time, especially if it's constant. And that's what vigilance, that, that's what Simon's talking about as an epidemiologist. Uh, the, Twart Troutman was talking about, I, as a physician, I've been followed around the store, he said. Again, I, again, I, 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 I code that microaggression. When I go to buy something, I've been looked at askance. Again, that sort of nonverbal microaggression that, um, that the young, 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 young man from, from the high school shared with us earlier. I've seen a woman grab her purse, another microaggression. When I come into the elevator, and for goodness sake, I'm Dr. Troutman, so he thinks that because he's a professional that this shouldn't happen to him. But he says, but it does. So this idea that, that class protects you from everyday forms of racism, um, it's probably a myth. Right? Now, I can give you examples upon examples in our interviews and other sort of sources where you know, African Americans or Latinos or Asian Americans or Native Americans who walk into spaces and sometimes uh, you, I, we can be dressed to the T, but they still experience, we feel ex experience various forms of racism in the everyday in the form of racial microaggressions. I hope this works. Another, another response, right? Actually, because it hasn't been working for the last couple of presentations. Uh, and I tried it earlier and it did, so hopefully it will. It's about, this is a commercial. It's a Excedrin for Racial Tension Headaches commercial. Queen Latifah, Saturday Night Live about, um, about what, 11 years ago. But I think it still, it still serves us well today. But if you think about, when you, when you listen to this commercial, think about the types 
Context affects response. Okay? Please work. Do I this is a demonstration yes, of flip for Matt. Definitely. From the moment I get it, it's Denise, we need this. Denise, we need that. Which is stressful, because my name is Linda. Denise is the other black woman that works here. By 10 a.m., someone in the copy room makes a joke about Kobe Bryant, and everyone looks at me to make sure it's okay. Then I smile like it's okay. But really, my head and neck are starting to throb. Then I spend the rest of the afternoon training my interns and answering their questions like, yes, black This is a demonstration champion. of flip no, I don't know any good reggae clubs around here. And yes, Condoleezza Rice is very articulate. Why do you sound so surprised? And no, I can't tell you where to buy weed. And that's when I reach for Excedrin. New Excedrin for racial tension headaches. Excedrin RT works fast, taking me from, oh, no, you didn't, to I wish a mother would. This is a demonstration. Well, there it is. It wasn't here earlier, but it's been keeps coming back. Whoever that woman is trying to tell me, don't use this. Um, but anyway, again, if you go through and, and, and listen to this commercial, like look at the transcript, you'll see the, how the how the model plays itself out in terms of the type, uh, the context, the her her the effects that it have has on her and her finding her response at the end. Um, Responses, let's talk about responses to racial microaggressions. Denial. Often people of color will deny they exist. That's a, that, 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 we see that often in our, in our, in our research, um, unfortunately. But well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, that's what people are experiencing. Um, they're not the majority, obviously, but some people do deny that racism exists. And, we, and, and often I go back and I'll read, I, I read autobiographies also. To, to go back and look at people's stories, li lived experiences, life histories. And I'll, I'll read for microaggression. I'll use that as a code as I'm reading autobiographies. And sometimes you'll hear this denial of that racism exists. Um, yeah, I, again, I'm not, so, I'm not sure if, uh, if uh, Ben Carson, Dr. Carson, sometimes exudes that when he talks, that, you know, that, that denies that racism is, is, is that, that important. Uh, he, he, he tells a different story about how he was successful. Self-policing. We don't go to certain places. We don't go to those malls, or we don't go to certain stores in those malls, or we don't go to certain restaurants, or we don't go to certain places. Proving them wrong. This comes out so often in our research, right, that people of color say, I'm going to prove that stereotype wrong. I'm going to prove that your view of me wrong and I'll die doing it, right? Uh, that's a John Henryism sort of idea. Resistance, we push back. You heard a little bit of that resistance in Queen Latifah there at the end, right? Uh, but there are other forms of resistance that we'll talk about in a second. Create counter spaces, places where you heal. There's a, there's a place at UCLA What I didn't mention is that, that there was a, a, a real pushback at, that, present, at, at that, um, that Kanye Western party at UCLA two weeks ago. Black students basically went and tried to disrupt the party. But the very next day, and, and they were met with um, UC police, basically kept them away from the, uh, the white fraternity and sorority members there, there at the party. The next day, Black students uh, met at the Bear and marched uh, to Murphy Hall, which is our main administrative hall at UCLA. Um, but the Black Bear, if you don't know anything about UCLA, there's something called Black Wednesday. And black people, black students between 12 and 2 go to the Bear. That's, that's, that, that's, that, I would call that a counter space, a place where people go to see other folks that look like them, especially at a place like UCLA where there are so few black students. Various art forms. I'll give you an example of that in a second. Right now we're looking at, at humor as, as an example of, 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 uh, of responses to everyday race or responses to racism. I mean, we're looking at different, different various uh, comedians over time, you know, the, the Dick Gregory's, for those of us of an earlier generation, um, the, the Richard Pryor's, 
the Moms Mabelys. Um, Dave Chappelle's programs, I think, are really powerful. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them are really, really powerful sort of examples of how we use humor to deal with everyday forms of racism. Um, Key and Peele, some of them are, are, are really powerful sort of messages that are being sent as, as examples. And I think we're trying to sort of look at those examples and analyze those examples, critically analyze, uh, analyze those examples as uh, responses to everyday forms of racism. Um, these three, I think, I'm, I'm going to share with you examples of them in this next uh, couple of slides. Um, in, in, 19, in 2013, late 2013, uh, a group of Harvard students met and formed this group that eventually came out with this campaign called I2M Harvard. Now, they're not the ones who started the I2M campaign. The first time I seen that campaign was a couple of months before that, probably in the spring of the previous year, 2000, I'm, I'm sorry, 2013, at Fordham University, University of New York City. But there's, this is the one that took off. This is the one that people really look to as, uh, as one of the more powerful I2M campaigns. And it's led by, um, among many leaders at, 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 of, of, uh, of this campaign, but one of the primary leaders, because she, would, she had, was taking a course in African American studies at Harvard, and she, she did part of this for one of her papers, uh, is Kamiko Matsuda Lawrence. Kamiko Matsuda Lawrence, her, 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 her mother is Mari Matsuda, one of the founders of critical race theory in the law. And her father is Charles Lawrence, one of the founders of critical race theory in the law. And this is their daughter. And she basically, she, in, in, in addition to this, I mean, if you go to their Tumblr page, if you get a chance, go to their Tumblr page, and you'll see examples of, of everyday forms of racism that, peop, that, that black people experience at the Harvard campus. And so these are really powerful sort of ways of sharing what they're experiencing, what they're going through. Uh, just words on, on a whiteboard, right? Uh, sharing those experiences. But they also, she also directed and wrote this play, getting back to an artistic response, right? Uh, it's called I2M Harvard. Uh, it's, it's our stories by us, for us. It came out in March 7th, 2014. And up until about a month or so ago, I had, I was, I was wondering if it was gonna go on the road, if it was gonna travel, if there's ways I can see it, did anybody tape it? It turns out that you can get the, you can look at it now. And I recommend you take a look at it. It's 19 segments. It's at their Tumblr page. You can download them or watch them. Um, and plus the credits. There's 20 actual episodes, but the, there's 19 segments. It's an amazing sort of uh, artistic sort of expression of everyday racism there at Harvard that these, uh, uh, the, the, our colleagues share with us. So take, take a look at it. But one of the persons who was there at that play on, on March 7, 2014, was Patricia Williams, another founder of critical race theory in the law. Uh, she's a professor at, at Columbia University in the law school. Uh, she writes a, 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 a piece for the Nation magazine periodically called The Diary of a Mad Law Professor. And so after that, after she's seen that play, this is what she wrote in The Nation. She said, they were treated with open disdain. The champagne flutes snatched from their hands at cocktail parties that they were mistaken for waiters. They were figured as criminals when they walked across campus. Their sexual prowess is inter interrogated. Their beauty denigrated. They hesitated before asking a question in class. For a dumb question from a white person isn't heard as a reflection on all white people. But any question from a black person tends to be scrutinized for inherent inferiority proof that the student's lonely little voice is the evil marker of where a more qualified white person ought to be sitting. The, these words and these sentences, the, 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 this, these combined sentences, I, I, I've told people in so many different contexts, God, I wish I had written that. It's an amazing sort of way of talking about the things that I do research on. And she just nailed it. Uh, but I, I recommend you go to her blog site and just sort of read the whole piece. It's a really powerful piece where she's reflecting on that play. But if you can, get it, go to the Tumblr page and, and look at those segments. 
uh, those 19 segments. It's, it's, a, it's a really powerful experience. So again, if you, maybe after this presentation, or if you haven't done it already, Google I2M, and you'll find all kinds of sites all across the country, all across the world, where they're taking on this campaign, right? Trying to reclaim space that they feel that they've been um, marginalized in. Another response, again, going back to Justice Sotomayor, she said this, she said, in my colleague's view, examining the racial impact of legislation only perpetuates racial discrimination. That's Justice Roberts. If you go back and read some of the, the, the opinions, uh, uh, the school integration opinions. The refusal to accept the stark reality that race matters is regrettable. The way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to speak openly and candidly on the subject of race and to apply the Constitution with eyes open to the unfortunate effects of centuries of racial discrimination. As members of the judiciary tasked with intervening to carry out the guarantee of equal protection, we ought not sit back and wish away rather than confront the, ra the racial inequality that exists in our society. Again, she's given us sort of uh, answers, responses. Um, not only just should we openly and candidly talk about race and racism, Although she didn't talk about racism, I would, I would hope that you would put, I should put in brackets racism. I think that's what we really have to talk about. Um, but she's asking us to confront the inequality that exists in society. A sitting justice of the Supreme Court. So what can we do? Because we often get this question, you know, what, what, what do I do or what can we do? And I, I don't have answers. I think answers will come in discussion in other spaces that you find yourselves in. You have to engage with each other to deal with these issues. But I would say that Chet helped us, though, going back to that 1974 article. He said, the, the black, and I would, I would also add people of color, must be taught to recognize microaggressions and construct his, and I would add her, future by taking appropriate action at each instance of recognition. Recognition, action. So I would add, though, that there's this piece. I'm a Fredian, so I, Freddy helps me in, inject, interject here. There has to be this critical reflection before you act. Um, and we've got to talk about what that means, critical reflection, in this, in this context. But I would argue that we need that critical reflection before we move to appropriate action that, that Chet was asking us to engage in. And so again, what can we do? I would say we have to acknowledge our own racial history, all of us. Because each of us have a racial history. I have a colleague of mine, and some of you probably do this in your own classes. Uh, Tyrone Howard teaches an undergraduate course at, at, at UCLA where he asks all of his students to do a racial history. Right? That, that, that's an important part of their grade. And often, m most students don't have that opportunity. But he finds that white students rarely have that opportunity to talk about their racial history. And it can be really, really important as a pedagogical tool, as a, as a way to engage each other uh, about some of these issues. About how, and again, our own racial history and how we view ourselves, but how we view others. I would also argue that we have to confront our own biases. Each of us have biases. We have to confront them. We've got to deal with them. And then finally, I, I say we have to actively work to develop our recognition as Chet is telling us, our reflection and our action skills. Thank you. <laughs>